Selamat sore, Bapak-Bapak, Ibu-Ibu sekalian. We're not going to do the whole thing in, in, in Indonesian. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for a discussion with Pak Tom uh, Lembong, former Trade and Investment Minister of Indonesia. My name is Jay Rosengard, and I am the faculty chair of the Harvard Kennedy School Indonesia program. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements um, on the Ash Center's behalf. First, the Ash Center acknowledges the land on which Harvard University site is a traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize the continuing presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipnuk nations. Today's discussion is being recorded and will be publicly available on the Ash Center's YouTube channel um, at the conclusion of the session. Although Pat Tom needs no introduction for most of you, please allow me to summarize just a few highlights of his background for those of you not yet familiar with, with him. From co-founding the first Indonesia-focused first Indonesia private equity firm to becoming Indonesia's trade and investment minister, and then chairman of the Indonesia Investment Coordinating Board, Thomas Trikasi Lembong, formerly known as or familiarly known as Tom Lembong or Pak Tom. We call you Pak Tom? Okay. Yeah. Call me Tom. Uh, call me Tom, okay. Um, has come a long way since he received his Bachelor of Arts in, in Architecture and Urban Design from Harvard University in 1994, class of 94. I should note that although previous to becoming a cabinet minister, Pak Tom um, spent most of his time in the private sector, he already indicated his desire to serve the public interest when he served as the division head and senior vice president at the Indonesia Indonesian Bank Restructuring Agency, IBRA, for those of you who know the acronym, from 2000 to 2002, to help resolve the financial sector fallout from the East Asian financial crisis. The impact on Indonesia, it took roughly 100% of GDP to recapitalize the banking system. So. Um, very young, maybe a little naive, <laughs> a little bit masochistic you took on this job to sort it all out. Um, two other notable accomplishments are being selected as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2008 and receiving the Asia Society Australia Victoria Distinguished Fellowship in 2017. Um, you can find much more about him if you just Google very high profile, big digital footprint. But this is, these are the highlights for those of you who just want the executive version. Please don't Google me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let us now proceed to the main program, which will be a fireside chat for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A with the audience for the remaining um, 20 minutes. So first I'm going to ask Pat Tong to share his experiences from Wall Street and Indonesia's private sector to serving in Indonesia's public sector, what he describes as from profitocracy to bureaucracy. Yes. Um, we will also discuss Indonesia's growing importance in the global community and economy, as well as how Indonesia's nascent democracy can best navigate the potential economic, social, political storms ahead. So let us start at the beginning before we dive deeper into your private and public careers. First of all, welcome back to your alma mater. Thank you. Um, a triumphant return. Please share with us a bit about your, your university days at Harvard in particular. What influence has Harvard had on your professional and personal development? How did your time at Harvard help you to be successful in both making money and improving the lives of fellow citizens? That's the first question. No softball questions from Harvard. <laughs> very broad, very broad. Uh, well, first, I uh, really want to thank uh, you, Professor Rosengard, and Melissa, and uh, Dan, and you know Jordan, Alvin, everyone who helped make this <laughs> gathering this afternoon possible. And thank you to the Ash Center, to the Asia Center, and to all of you guys for making time uh, today. <clears throat> um, you know, 
I, I really can't underscore enough uh, how impactful my four years at Harvard were you know, on my career, on my personality, my character. Um, and, you know, I guess it all comes down to individuals, right? Um, I mean, I could go on and on about a series of spectacular intellectual and personal experiences I've had at Harvard. Uh, but really, you know, I would highlight one legendary professor in particular, which is the professor John Stilgo, uh, who teaches at the Graduate School of Design, as well as at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And uh, he's a legendary professor of uh, the visual environment, right? So my late father, was a medical doctor, actually encouraged me to, to try to become an architect, right? But when you're pursuing a liberal arts degree, <laughs> uh, the best thing you can study to try to go to architecture school at Harvard uh, is a subject today called arts, film, visual studies, right? Uh, which includes within it a study of the built environment, right? But uh, Professor Stilgo is so unique, right? Because he taught us to look at people, you know, the people moving within the built environment, right? So look at the people, look at the built environment, look at the nature, look at the landscape, look at the people, right? And uh, as I like to point out uh, to, to our staff, uh, to give you an example, uh, studies show that up to 70% of person-to-person -person communication is outside the cognitive content of your spoken words. It's in your facial expression, it's in your gesticulation, it's in the you know, volume and inflections and tonality of your voice, right? And basically, the one thing that Professor Stilgo taught me was to become an extremely astute observer, right? Of people, of built environments, of the visual context, of context, right? Uh, so that's just one example, right? Uh, of, uh, of, you know, something really significant skill-wise that I feel I learned at Harvard, right? Now, I do have to emphasize something else. Uh, I do have to probably issue a bit of a mea culpa. You know, one thing I did not learn at Harvard, which is very, very important for a fulfilling career, is humility, <laughs> right? So I have to admit that when I came out of Harvard, I was an intolerable, arrogant prick. <laughs> 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 and it took me, you know, some serious failures, including like going bankrupt uh, in the lead up, you know, to the Asian financial crisis uh, that finally taught me real life, practical and absolutely precious, invaluable humility. And, you know, one of the, one of the most significant discussions you could ever get into is to actually discuss what humility is and what humility is not, right? I'm not sure if you want to do that now, you know, have to do it during the Q&A whatever, but this is just to give a balanced view, like, you know, an example of what I learned at Harvard and an example of what I didn't learn at Harvard, uh, and, and let that be a cautionary tale for all of you. <laughs> while it's fresh, maybe, oh? while it's fresh, uh, maybe just give us an example of humility and not humility. So <clears throat> um, many of you would be familiar that in Southeast Asia, we have this incredibly strong culture of politeness. Right? We're incredibly polite uh, to the point of sometimes, you know, be, be overdoing it, you know, being, being too, you know, too soft-spoken or too self-deprecating, right? But that's not actually what humility is all about, right? Uh, <clears throat> during a tough time uh, in my firm's uh, development, at one point we brought a, a, a very fantastic uh, ex executive coach uh, to to frankly coach the executives, including myself, right, uh, during a time of of the firm's crisis, um, and and he gave us like a great definition, right? Like, for example, humility is not only saying I'm sorry, but saying I'm sorry and and what can I do to make it right, right? So it's not only admitting that you're wrong, which is hard enough, right? But then actually putting in the work, putting in the effort to, to compensate, right? To, to do what it takes to rectify your error, right? Uh, 
I think, you know, humility is also uh, obviously uh, being open, right? Uh, being very, very open. And one thing that's extremely difficult, uh, Professor, that's very tricky about humility is like ego and, and arrogance have insidious ways of creeping in, right? You, you really don't feel it. Like, again, let this be a cautionary tale to all of you. Like, whether it's your, in your 20s or in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s, right? Uh, your successes have a way of making you complacent, right? Your successes have a way of validating your strongest biases, right? And then uh, abandoning those biases is extremely difficult. Like, really, really difficult. Uh, I could give some banal examples, uh, but... You know, many things that are absolutely the source of your success in your 20s will be the source of your failure in your 30s, right? The things that are, that are massively powerful for you in your 30s will be your downfall in your 40s, right? And that continues into your 50s and, and so on. And one of the trickiest transitions from decade to decade is to at first realize, oh my God, this thing that's been making me so successful all this time is now undoing me. Right, and then actually changing yourself uh, to reflect uh, that reality, and then uh, the thing that you always thought was a weakness or something holding you back is actually going to be the thing that's now going to define your success in this new decade. Right, and so that's another example, you know, in my view, of a very practical example of humility in your career and life is, is making that transition. Right, because again. What would drive your success in your 40s is very different from what drives your success in your 30s. Uh, so, great examples. I mean, this is this is lifelong wisdom. Cherish it, and it's kind of the opposite of I would say. Give this country song. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. But well, this is the opposite. Okay, and it's it's um, in our in our art of persuasion class, they talk about different types of apologies and, and really drill down into your example of of you know, what is, is appropriate and effective um, versus self-serving, essentially. So um, I, I think I will move on then to the Please. next question. So we're going to now leave Harvard Yard, have it yet, okay, we're going to move to Manhattan and beyond. So why did you decide to head to Wall Street for your first job <clears throat> and then return to Indonesia, still immersed in the private sector? Right. So... Um, I guess, you know, I'm very much a child of my era because, as you'll remember, Professor Rosengard, uh, the, the late 1980s to the sort of mid-1990s was in a way like a golden age for Wall Street, right? Um, I mean, that was really uh, when leveraged buyouts uh, were being pioneered. Uh, that was when Michael Milken was pioneering the junk bond market, right? And then uh, uh, it really uh, went even further with the computing revolution, right? With with very powerful desktop PCs, uh, it, it gave birth to the to the uh, financial instruments called derivatives, right? I mean, derivatives are so mathematically compute intensive that it took that computing revolution uh, to to basically uh, mass produce. Uh, financial derivatives. Uh, so that was when fixed income derivatives, interest rate derivatives, equity deriv derivatives were first uh, being brought into the market. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I got to say, Professor, in, in my case, it feels like I, I sort of had finance in my blood for a long time, you know? So I went to a boarding school, not very far from here, at a school called Deerfield Academy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, they had a fantastic library. And... Uh, at some point, maybe maybe it had to do with the 1987 stock market crash, right? But I just went to the section of the library where they had books on the banking sector and on banking sector history. And that's where I discovered like the history of like Junior Spencer Morgan, John Pierpont Morgan, right? And three generations of Morgans who gave rise to like JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Morgan Grenfell, and so on. And then in 1990, this legendary biographer, Ron Chernow, came out with this historic book called uh, The House of Morgan, right? And from that point on, I think I was pretty much hooked, 
Like I, I was as utterly fascinated, right, by Wall Street, by investment banks, um, and then uh, uh, it's funny. I, I have to admit, I guess books had a lot of influence on my life because as I was looking back, uh, I read three more of Ron Chernow's books. You know, the other one was uh, the Warburgs, another uh, Wall Street dynasty, uh, but also his biography of Alexander Hamilton. It probably also inspired me uh, to to take a leap into public service. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I guess uh, that was the era. That was a time, you know, uh, a golden age for Wall Street, uh, and and that was also the time that Wall Street was going international, right? And uh, Asia was booming. Uh, that boom would eventually end with the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Uh, but yeah, uh, I guess I, I went with the flow. Um, if those of you who follow the news, this this name, J.P. Morgan, now J.P. Morgan Chase, just bought First Republic, another bank bailout. So they're still very much, um, well, they're even bigger <laughs> and more dangerous to fail. Um, and Alexander Hamilton, of course, founded our central bank. So, and if any any of you seen the musical Hamilton? In, you know, his dueling in Nuremberg and all that. So um, both of them are still, you know, very much uh, part of, of U.S. history and culture and, and the financial sector. Um, could you tell us a little bit more? I mean, you were doing very well in Wall Street and you kind of, these were targets of opportunity and you went with the flow, which is really kind of a West Coast thing, you know, um, being from the West Coast, go with the flow. But why did you then go back to Indonesia um, while you were doing so well in, in Wall Street? Well, uh, I got hired into Morgan Stanley, okay. uh, always with a view to be sent out to their operations in Asia, right? And so <clears throat> whilst I started uh, in New York headquarters, uh, eventually I would be transferred to Morgan Stanley's fledgling Singapore office. And eventually I would join the effort to form a local joint venture in Indonesia with a, with a major local securities firm. Uh, and that, you know, all came crashing down with the 1997 Asian financial crisis, which was, you know, one of the failures that finally taught me some humility, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, again, at the time, uh, that was maybe the first major Asian boom, right? We've had many Asian booms since, and we might be in the middle of one right now, uh, but that was really, you know, the time, as I mentioned, that Wall Street went global. Uh, everyone from Goldman Sachs to JP Morgan to Morgan Stanley was opening offices across Asia. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and I was very much part of that. Yeah. And you were a little bit ahead of your time. This was a time when people were just discovering Southeast Asia. Um, so first mover, get there a little bit early, know the market. I mean, it makes perfect sense. What's remarkable, you know, you wouldn't believe this now, right? But when I went back to Southeast Asia in 1995, China was desperately poor and Indonesia was much, much richer, right? Uh, so Indonesia was already doing IPOs of major companies on a NASDAQ when China was still a backwater, you know? Like we were doing, uh, you know, 144A bonds uh, when China hadn't really even fully opened up yet. Uh, so. You know, Indonesian companies, some Indonesian companies were paying $100 million per year in fees to Wall Street banks, and China was nowhere. Uh, so, yeah, Southeast Asia was, was booming uh, at a time when China uh, had just, was just getting started, was just getting started, so. We can come back to any of these topics in the Q&A, but I'd like to move forward a little bit and step back from the, um, the micro, which is a, a brief glimpse of your life's journey to date, to the macro, which is the national and global um, a landscape. So another really soft, easy question for you. What are the most dramatic changes in Indonesia and globally since you graduated? <laughs> or let me reword it to right. make it even more difficult. What are our greatest challenges today right. as opposed right. to your student days? And you, you already started that a little right. bit. Right. So, you know, again, uh, you, you wouldn't believe how simple the world was uh, 30 years ago when I was sitting where you're sitting, right, as a student. Back then, no smartphones, no social media, in fact, no internet, 
right? Uh, the internet sort of came into being, uh, the World Wide Web you know, as such came into being about a year after I graduated uh, in 1995 with the first ever web browser called Mosaic, right? And then eventually that was uh, commercialized uh, into a new browser called Netscape, uh, which a young programmer named Mark Andreessen uh, had put out there, right? Uh, so fast forward 30 years, uh, you know, we now have such complexity. We have so many overlapping crises that we have this term poly crisis, <laughs> right? Like overlapping crisis in climate, in geopolitics, in arguably public health, right? Uh, so it is, it is an infinitely more complex world, right? And I think one of the biggest challenges is that Number one, uh, these crises are all interlocking, right? The climate crisis is causing, is exacerbating the public health crisis. Like the public health crisis is exacerbating the inequality crisis, like the crisis of capitalism. The inequality and crisis of capitalism is exacerbating the geopolitical conflict, right? And run and run we go. So, so that's number one. Number two, the biggest problem is that Solving these interlocking crises requires an unprecedented level of international cooperation, right? At a time precisely when the opposite is happening, right? Uh, trends around the world are in favor of retreat, right? Of like national self-interest, right? Uh, but again, if you look at the data, if you look at the facts, you know, to use one simple example, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, can only be solved through international collaboration and international coordination, right? Uh, so, I think um, those are those are the crises ostensibly, right? Uh, but you know, it's pointless to talk about crisis if you don't talk about solutions, right? So, uh, crises are difficult because the solutions are challenging, right? So, but. Therefore, we have to talk about the solutions, right? Now, there's, there's many, many solutions, uh, but my one message to all of you today, if I can choose just one, is that at the bottom of all these crises, in my view, is a moral crisis. It's a crisis of morality, right? And, and for each of us individually and for all of us collectively, like the one thing that I believe we, we need to do is to bring morality more onto the table, right? Is to basically uh, uh, start tackling the moral crisis or our moral failings as individuals, as groups, as countries, as organizations. Uh, because unless we go to the root cause, right? Unless we start tackling the root causes, we we'll just be jumping from crisis to crisis. Right, like you, you can't solve just a short-term crisis. You know, uh, you have to solve the medium and long-term crisis alongside. Because if you only solve each crisis by turns, all you will ever do is be on a treadmill of solving one crisis after another. Right. So if you think about it, uh, the feeling that you can pollute at will is a moral failing. Right. The feeling that like money should matter above all things uh, is a moral failing, right? Like uh, our failure to care, right? To have a heart uh, for other human beings is, is, a, is a moral failing, right? Uh, so uh, I know it runs the risk of being a bit squishy uh, and I'm a big fan, I'm a big proponent of a kind of a practical morality like a, a more hard-nosed, more hard-edged morality. Uh, but I'm telling you all, uh, and this is sort of a recurring theme for me since 2015, when I first joined, joined the cabinet and sort of diagnosed what I thought was a problem in Indonesia, around the world, and, and I believe will be a recurring theme for, for me for years to come. Uh, we have to tackle the moral crisis or moral crises at the root of all these you know, technical crises. I'm not going to let you off that easy. Okay, so... <laughs> This is a school of government, and our motto is make a difference. 
So yes, you might have these moral failings and and it's 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 perhaps a bit aspirational to try to cure that, but there you also talked about more pragmatic approaches, understanding that you might be dealing with just some of the symptoms and not the underlying cause, which would take a long time and and collective action, which is certainly not in the cards right now. So um, you mentioned, say, pollution. It, it's not right. It, right. Like you can destroy um, the environment for future generations. But I, I'm a public sector economist. I say, well, polluter pays. You know, make it expensive, internalize the cost. Um, and so maybe they don't do it out of altruism, but they do it out of self-interest for the public good. And we have... You mentioned COVID, and sometimes you need regulations um, to put the community over the individual. We we had all sorts of issues in the United States about masks or vaccines, and and sometimes you have mandates um, if you can't persuade, bring awareness, and you know others are at risk. Uh, my co-author Joe Stiglitz was saying, you know, your freedom to punch ends when it hits my nose. Kind of thing, you know, when you put others at risk, um, you, you you need a combination of incentives and awareness building that you're talking about, but you also need some pragmatic tools. So um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of, I think, a real problem in Indonesia, but not unique to Indonesia, and maybe given your experience with investment coordinating board and trade and investment, there, there is a growing economic nationalism in Indonesia, um, which certainly threatens the environment for foreign investment, um, unilateral retroactive changing of contracts, enforceability of contracts, and so on. So, um, and it's often done in the the idea of um, just nationalism or supply chain resiliency, but it's not really, um, it starts in, in mining but it's not restricted to that sector, extractive industry. So um, you can use that. Or another example where even though it's maybe not the underlying cause, the moral failure, um, as practitioners going out with a skill set and a lot of of spirit and energy to do good um, and, and have impact, could you give maybe some examples of, I, I would say, pragmatic responses to failure of morality? Well, <clears throat> Professor, um, I think one difficulty uh, with kind of moral solutions, right, uh, is that they can be very uh, non-obvious and very indirect, right? Uh, before I Before I continue on that, uh, let me also emphasize that this is a long-term solution. It's a long-term, right? Right. So this is something that we start, uh, and will take time. Uh, but uh, I believe in the sort of you know magic of compounding, right? Where you go from one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six, right? Uh, so it, it really snowballs, right? But uh, you just start with one, then go to two. Once you get two, you go to four, right? And it may, may seem frustratingly slow, right? Uh, but I, I promise you, it does snowball over time, right? Uh, now, back to the non-obvious nature of moral solutions. Uh, here, I want to emphasize the significance and impact of small things. Yeah? And give you an example. Uh, Resource nationalism that you referred to, uh, you know, corruption, like irrational regulations, uh, these are all made by people. These are all made by bureaucrats, right? Uh, and I like to point out, just as one example, one dimension, it's not the be all and end all, but one example I like to point out is like, look, uh, Unhappy bureaucrats will make unhappy policies, <laughs> right? Now, <clears throat> to give you an example of something very, very small, when I was at the uh, investment board, which was recently retitled the Ministry of for Investment, uh, my secretary general at one point pointed out to me, 
that 60% of our staff were women, right? And furthermore, he pointed out to me that of those women, 60% were uh, had babies or children under the, under the age of five, right? And so I innocuously just pragmatically asked, so uh, where's our daycare center? That we don't have one. That, oh, why don't we don't have a daycare center? Like if, you know, so many of our staff have babies or toddlers. Uh, and the upshot is we eventually created one. The only empty space they could find was directly under my boardroom, right? Uh, and so I would be hosting like trade ministers or investment ministers from around the world, right? And we'd be in a meeting, you know, like eight on eight, with serious discussion. And suddenly you'd hear this like, you know, children's laughter, <laughs> you know, outbursts of children's laughter or like babies crying, right? <laughs> uh, and again, you can be like a real stiff and, and turn red and apologize to your guests, like, I'm so sorry about this, right? Or you can say, isn't it wonderful? You're, you're hearing the sound of the future, right? But uh, I can't begin to describe to you guys uh, the reaction from our staff uh, to having a daycare center, right? Uh, and they were so happy, and it got me so much goodwill, right, uh, that, you know, I mean, I, I can't, you know, I didn't have time to try to measure performance or anything like that. But, but look, uh, in my heart of hearts, I just realized it was the right thing to do, right? And you just keep doing that, one thing after another. And my data and personal experience suggests that that is a way to go, you know? Uh, because actions do speak louder than words, right? And what you do, what you do speaks so much louder, right? Uh, than, than what you say. Uh, and, and these kinds of small things, right? Uh, are, are, this is, you know, what in poker they call your tell, yeah. right? The little things you do, like you, you, you don't realize how strong of a signal they send, right? So, you know, look, we politicians, uh, even we technocrats like to give grandiose speeches, you know, use a lot of sophisticated language jargon. Uh, but really, if we're going to tackle the root causes of our poly crisis is going to get, come down to, you know, small acts of kindness like this. I think that's a great example um, for management, um, increasing quality of work and probably productivity because of the, uh, the, the quality of the workspace. Could you give us an example of a small step um, addressing a big policy problem? Sure, sure. So uh, one problem in Indonesia, certainly, right? And uh, I believe in many countries and potentially increasingly in the US is uh, industry concentration, right? More and more industries are becoming oligopolistic, uh, even monopolistic, right? And these entrenched incumbents fight competition, yeah? Uh, <clears throat> well, in developing countries, we're in a way fortunate because we still have a lot of low-hanging fruit. We still have a lot of sort of easy reforms. Uh, one of the most powerful things you can do to reform a sector is to open it up to international competition, right? Uh, I'll give you just one example that I have direct experience with. You know, something as banal as the movie theater sector, like movie theater industry used to be a monopoly, right? Uh, it was a monopoly. So we used to have a thriving movie theater industry in the 1960s and 70s with thousands of mom and pop movie theaters. But uh, our president of 35 years, you know, President Soharto, who, who was a dictator, uh, eventually nationalized many industries, including the movie theater industry. It became a national licensed monopoly given to his half-brother, right? And literally, the number of movie theaters in Indonesia went from like 5,000 to like 300, right? Ticket prices went sky high, service suffered, uh, and, and basically, the, it suffocated the entire local movie production industry, right? Now, that was a very, very lucrative monopoly, uh, but it held back the whole industry. Now, actually, at that time, uh, uh, I was in private equity. And so we funded an entrepreneur. To, 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 to 
to do a startup that challenged a monopoly. It's a movie theater startup, right? And within three years, ticket prices collapsed 80%. Uh, an industry was growing 1% per year when the economy was growing 5 6% per year. So they're growing at 20%, 30% per year, right? A uh, number of screens across the, across the country multiplied. Like the ex-monopoly had to respond by quickly renovating their venues, right? Uh, expanding. And suddenly uh, you had enough screens to show not only Hollywood movies, but also local movies, right? And suddenly the movie production industry boomed, right? And today we have this really robust uh, movie theater industry, movie production industry, uh, growing, you know, I would say 14 to 17% per year, right? And again, finally, when I was in cabinet, I had the opportunity of working with our investment minister at the time, I was still trade minister, uh, and our telecoms and technology minister, and our education minister, uh, to abolish foreign ownership restrictions. Uh, so movie theater, movie production, movie distribution, went from 0% foreign ownership allowed, overnight to 100% foreign ownership allowed, right? And basically, American capital poured in, Korean capital poured in, right? And, and you know who was arguably the biggest beneficiary of all this opening and reform? The monopoly, right? Uh, they became so much bigger. Of course, their profit margin was much thinner, but that smaller profit margin was on a much bigger base, right? And they're now a leading player in an industry that's growing, you know, 14, 17% per year versus being the only player in an industry that's growing like 1% per year, right? So as I go around from sector to sector, trying to convince monopolists or oligopolists to open up, I, I tell them, look, who's going to be the biggest beneficiary of this? You guys, right? Like when we open up to international capital, like you'll have a line coming out your door of people wanting to give you money, wanting to invest in, in your company. And that's actually what happened. Uh, not even a year went by after, you know, my fellow ministers and I abolished the foreign ownership limit, like that uh, ex-monopoly got like a multi-hundred million dollar, like multi-hundred million dollar investment uh, turning, uh, from a sovereign wealth fund, uh, turning, them in, turning them into billionaires, right? Uh, so uh, it's not the, you know, the fairy tale ending that people expect where, you know, the evil monopoly is vanquished and put in its grave, right? Uh, so you do, you do have to be realistic. You know, you do have to... Uh, uh, allow people to reap the benefits uh, of change, right? Uh, even if they're actually the cause of the problem originally, right? It's a great example, and it's 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 a market-based example. You know, competition should improve consumer choice and lower costs, which it has. Um, but you made sure that you didn't try to destroy. The losers, you know, Correct. they they should have something to gain <clears throat> as well. And if I'm not mistaken, you also reduce that negative list dramatically. Again, the Correct. same idea, just open it up to competition, let the market work from that. So it's a regulatory change that allows it to be a more market-based environment with, with the results that you would hope for. And as you said, it's not perfect. But I think that's a really good example of just one government regulatory decision that would have a tremendous impact on one sector. Some sectors, of course, monopolies are too powerful, but in others, there might be more of an opportunity. So I think, so I just wanted to, to let you know that this gentleman was also quite practical, even though there's a long-term um, fundamental change that is hoped for in the interim, it's it's step by step. And in that same spirit, before we open up for, um, uh, questions. Um, an example that I've seen in a, in a much smaller scale, and it's just one government decision, it's about transparency. Um, people really hate when you go into a government office and you're supposed to pay all these fees that you shouldn't have to pay. Uh, and, I, and we're talking about like the common folks. Simply posting what the fees are, or there are no fees, greatly reduces the opportunity. Or in Indonesia many years ago, there was something called, it was a labor intensive public work campaign, Padat Karya, trying to create jobs for unskilled folk. Simply posting the wage that they were supposed to receive 
versus what they actually got, which was a fraction of the minimum wage, greatly reduced the opportunity to exploit the workers. And again, these are just, these are human decisions by government officials um, with the authority to do so. And they're just, again, rather than solve the problems, they're taking away opportunities to do ill. I mean, so I think it's the same idea. It doesn't solve all the problems about poverty in Indonesia or, or um, the difficulty of finding gainful employment, but at least, especially at the lower end, a very simple um, principle transparency, but in a way that, that people understand that just, you know, takes away opportunities or in Indonesia when they reform the property tax system and they stopped letting tax officials handle money and all payments had to be done through the banking system. Um, again, you're not changing the morality of the tax official, you take away the opportunity. Um, and of course the banks benefited, no fees, but they got to float. So little, again, little things like that, I think are in the same spirit. So like I said, it's, it's good to have the long-term aspiration, but as you're coming out of the school, um, feet on the ground, what can you do? Even these modest steps. I think that's kind of a nice way to, to close this part of our chat. And now it's time for your voices to be heard. Um, so we're gonna to switch to a Q&A session. Um, please wait for the microphone so that our recording can pick up your brilliant comments, your insights. Um, and then please follow three very simple rules. Tell us who you are, be brief so many people can speak, and end with a question mark. Okay, so floor is yours. Um, Hi there, I'm Phil Jordan. I'm a senior fellow here at the S Center. Um, I have a question about this intersection of morality and pragmatism. So I, I love this. And I'd like to ask the question in the context of decarbonization and clean energy. So obviously this is a moral imperative, um, but also there are some pragmatic and practical solutions that uh, need to be delivered. So the question is, uh, currently in Indonesia, could you talk a little bit about how uh, the government and the private sector is viewing this issue as both a moral issue um, and an economic imperative where there could be pragmatic solutions to growing the economy or creating just transitions uh, through that decarbonization or deployment of new technologies? I think we'll take a round of questions because there might be some um, overlap between them. Um, in the middle, we're, we're looking for some gender parity here, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering how- Who, who are you? Uh, I'm a Sukin from Harvard Law School. And I'm wondering, so what uh, social economic policy is undertaking in Indonesia for reduce social inequality? So because both of you talk about a lot about the social inequality, poverty. So Our self? No. Uh, inequality? In, in, inequality? Inequality, yeah, poverty. Um, inequality in Indonesia. Oh, Indonesian inequality, yeah, income yeah, inequality. They, yeah. Right. They, in Indonesia? Yeah, okay. in Indonesia, so domestic, uh, economic uh, policy to reduce social inequality. And how do you think they, when we take uh, some implement uh, social economic policy to reduce social inequality, that can improve the social morality? Do you think the morality level high in rich people or in poor people? Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, if somebody up front, please. Wait for the microphone, please. We want to get on the recording. Hello, Pato Lembong. My name is Adi Putra from um, HBS, second year. Um, so I have a question. Um, what advice are you going to give to the new president, which is going to be elected next year, um, regarding the best strategy for Indonesia to avoid a middle income trap? That's all. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for for crossing over from the dark side to the light <laughs> side. Maybe that's, we'll start with that. I think those are very um, challenging questions. Uh, <clears throat> so on uh, carbon emissions and uh, government and private sector, right? Indonesia right now, how, how are they feeling about it? 
right? Are they seeing this as an opportunity? Um, I think when you have a whole bunch of coal mining billionaires as ministers in the cabinet, uh, it shows you how serious you know a government is going to be uh, about uh, decarbonizing uh, the economy, right? Uh, look, I think specifically to the issue of energy transition, right? Uh, and decarbonizing. Uh, personally, I, I have to put a lot of my confidence in technology, right? Uh, technology and basically market forces. Uh, as probably most or all of us here know, like renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy in probably 70 to 90% of the planet today, right? If you eliminate distortions, it can actually compete on its own merits. Right. Um, I think it's a clear opportunity to gain competitive advantage through cheaper energy, through more reliable energy, through more consistent energy prices. Right. And I think it's the government's role and responsibility to, to point that out incessantly, right? Uh, to make that an integral part of our industrial policy that, look, unless you do this, you're going to be outcompeted by your competitors in Vietnam, you know, in China, uh, in other countries who are getting on the ever declining renewable energy cost curve, right? Renewable energy is a technology, not a commodity, right? So the technologies get better and better over time, the costs go lower and lower over time, right? So your competitors who are doing this will become more and more competitive over time. And those who are not doing this, who are stuck to, you know, volatile, unstable commodity prices like coal prices or oil prices, like you're, you're going to be at a disadvantage, right? Uh, but it's interesting. Um, this is why, you know, that, that has to be a big part of the solution, right? Look, don't get me wrong. I'm a big believer in market-based solutions, right? market-oriented solutions. Uh, but I increasingly believe it's not enough, right? It's got to be more than that. It's got to be a moral imperative. And the thing I would say there is thank God for our young people, right? Uh, I think Indonesia, much as in other countries around the world, it's the young people, the young consumers, the young voters, the young students, the young workers who overwhelmingly uh, care about uh, environmental issues, climate issues, and so on, right? And so uh, I'm really counting on the young people, frankly, right, to force my generation uh, and the generations ahead of me, right, above me, uh, to do what's right for business, but also what the consumer and the young want us to do, right? Uh, look, uh, At one point, I, I told President Jokowi, right, uh, my boss at the time, uh, about a uh, Korean president, admittedly dictator, I think, uh, Park Chung-hee, right? Uh, I think, I believe he had something like a monthly or annual garbage day, right? And basically, the Korean president, as far as I know, uh, maybe with some ministers would actually don like a yellow vest and get into the street with like a garbage bag and pick garbage off the streets, right? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I believe that uh, policymakers and politicians have this fallacy that you get rich first, then you get clean, <laughs> right? But I actually believe the data shows the opposite. I actually believe the data shows that you get clean first, then you get rich, right? I remember going to Singapore, like in the 1980s, when Jakarta, Indonesia was still very dirty, right? Like garbage everywhere, right? And you come to Singapore and you're just struck by how clean everything was, right? So imagine an FDI investor from America, like arriving into Southeast Asia and come to Singapore like, wow, this place is so clean. This place is cleaner than New York. So this was like cleaner than Chicago. Like, okay, this looks like a place I can invest in, 
right? And I understand that uh, very controversial uh, Rwanda President uh, Kagame has uh, copycatted Singapore strategy. Apparently, you go to Kigali, capital of Rwanda, it's shockingly clean, right? Uh, and the same applies to like public health, right? Like people have this fallacy thinking that first you get rich, then you get healthy, right? But again, I, I believe the data shows uh, from countries like Korea or Thailand, uh, they made visionary and long-term investments, like far-sighted investments in public health, right? And, and get such a healthy labor force as a result in Korea and Thailand uh, and, and well-educated to boot and that fostered the industrial revolution and advanced economic development, right? Whereas I think you know China, and to some degree, you know a lot of developing countries like Indonesia, like we thought the opposite, like industrialize, right? Attract investment, get rich, right? And then we'll get then we'll we'll have money to make people healthy, right? Then we'll have money to to clean up the mess. But unfortunately, it's not working. So. To give you an example, uh, look, for reasons you can imagine, I think data on this is quite scarce, but I understand that like up to half of all of China's farmland is heavily polluted, right? So basically decades of industrialization with scant attention to pollution controls, right? Factories dumping heavy metals into rivers, right? Dumping chemicals into rivers, farmers, use that river water to irrigate their fields. Now, you know, how do you decontaminate half of a country's farmland? It's too late, right? So basically, these social policies around cleanliness, uh, public health, environmental, actually have to be upfront, right? Like those are actually the things that are gonna enable you to develop an economy to become rich, right? Uh, now, these are all actually more in the realm of social policies, right? And one of the most powerful remarks I've ever heard was from legendary Singapore senior minister, uh, Tarman Shanmugaratman. Uh, I had the privilege of being invited to a very small gathering uh, at the Davos summit. Not more than 70 people in a room, top policymakers, you know, like IMF. Uh, there was a couple of prime ministers in there, uh, a lot of ministers from around the world. And Tarman, uh, so Klaus Schwab, the head of the Economic Forum, right, asked uh, Tarman to stand up and share some remarks. And Tarman spoke so eloquently about how in our world, economic policies, you know, become so dominant. It's become the sexy discussion subject that is crowded out in the discussion about social policy. Like social policy, you know, is not fashionable. Uh, in fact, you know, it runs the risk of like, you know, getting the stigma of being social engineering, right? But if you think about it, like our social values, our social principles, our social practices is what like define our economies, right? Like the economies you get will reflect the social values and the social character that we have, right? So actually, you know, again, uh, I really believe in so many ways, in so many places, we've got it backwards. We've got the cart before the horse, right? Uh, we've got the economy pulling society rather than society pulling the economy, right? Uh, <clears throat> and that goes to your question, uh, Sukin, about, uh, and I'm so delighted that you use the phrase socio-economic policies, right? Uh, uh, and that you touch on the issue of inequality. Uh, so I, I think inequality is another crisis, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, incoming Singapore Prime Minister Lawrence Wong. Kennedy School graduate. Oh, excellent. <laughs> uh, recently gave a very uh, striking speech. Uh, he said, look at how divided and polarized countries much richer and older than us are becoming, how can we be sure that we will not become polarized, that we will not become divided the way they have? Uh, and again, I think 
being at an early stage of development right now, developing countries like Indonesia have an opportunity to prevent inequality from early on, right? So right now, like 80% of economic growth is still ahead of us, right? And so again, similar to far-sighted investments in public health, early education, environment, you know, clean environment, like we, we've got to tackle this upfront because by the time, you know, by the time you, you reach 30 years later, it'll be too late, right? You'll have these massive inequalities, much like you have all this, you know, polluted farmland. And, you know, fixing that will either be tremendously costly or impossible, right? Uh, <clears throat> with, with, with respect to specific policies, right? Uh, look, uh, I, I believe in conditional cash transfers, definitely, right? Uh, we have a much bigger problem in Indonesia, which is that our tax collection to GDP ratio is astonishingly low. Like it's it's in the single digits. It's like below 10%, right? Like Thailand even manages like 14%. Like Philippines manages like 17%. Like the OECD average, I think is like 25%, right? Uh, you know, many European countries collect 35% of GDP in taxes. Uh, we only collect like nine, right? So that doesn't exactly give us enough funding uh, to help the poor, right, to address inequality. Uh, so that's something we're going to have to fix uh, before we can we can do more on poverty alleviation and, and addressing inequality. Uh, and lastly, uh, Mas Adi, uh, what's my advice to the incoming president next year? Uh, it's very relevant because I happen to be uh, an economic policy advisor and international relations advisor to one of the candidates, right, Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan. Uh, and look, I think uh, I'm very proud of my time in cabinet under President Jokowi, right? Uh, and I believe President Jokowi has accomplished many, many good things, right? Uh, but President Jokowi is overwhelmingly what we would call a hardware guy, yeah? So he, you know, as a lifelong businessman, uh, he believes in factories. He believes in hardware. He believes in highways, in power plants, in seaports, in airports, uh, in automotive industries, in nickel smelters, right? Uh, which is, you know, how he and I bonded, right? I'm a lifelong businessman. He's a lifelong businessman. Uh, and even better, uh, his function in his business was as a salesman, and which was my function in my business, right? So we are both fellow salesmen. Uh, but... I believe uh, we now desperately need to swing from hardware to software. Yeah. So basically, all this focus on the hardware, I would argue, has caused a big neglect on the software. Things like health, things like education, things like environment, things like the justice system, law and order, right? Uh, and uh, We're out of money anyway, <laughs> you know, like basically, uh, you know, we've spent all the fiscal resources, you know, uh, prudently at our disposal on a 10 year binge on infrastructure. Right. Uh, and so basically it'll also become a macroeconomic necessity to slow down on all this construction, on all this like infrastructure and, and building. <laughs> and, uh, and and pivot uh, to uh, you know much less capital intensive, right? Uh, efforts to to reform our public health system, our education system, uh, and and our environment, right? Uh, so, like it or not, that pivot is coming. Like we we have to shift growth engines from infrastructure uh, and, and hardware to. Uh, software uh, and labor intensive industries, right? Which are overwhelmingly service sector, right? Things like tourism, like education, healthcare. These are all labor intensive service industries as opposed to like smelters, uh, you know, automotive factories filled with robots, which are capital intensive, uh, not labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, 
again, whilst uh, all this hardware spending has been very positive for GDP growth, uh, it has not been that great for wages. Yeah, like all these, uh, all these projects, all these programs are capital intensive. And ultimately the benefits of these projects accrue to a handful of owners of capital, right? They don't, the, the benefits are not widespread uh, to, to, to workers. Uh, now you might argue, well, highways benefit society, right? Like the, the users of those highways are, are reaping the benefits, uh, but still, you know, like highway users uh, pale in comparison to the broad labor force at large, right? Uh, so you really have to focus on uh, on service sector, which uh, is only 55% of GDP at, at the moment in Indonesia. In advanced countries like US, I believe it's like 90%, right? Uh, there's a happy medium there somewhere, right? Uh, <clears throat> but really it's uh, services industries which uh, are labor intensive and, and generate both jobs uh, and wages. Just that last point. So if Indonesia wants to be a high income country, they have to pay higher wages and you can only justify higher wages by increased productivity. And that's in the services, not in the brick and mortar you're talking about. And I would also say that um, I am not a believer in the middle income trap. Middle income traps are created by bad policies and that is by bad government. And you can also um, become a high income country like the East Asian Tigers by good government and good leadership. So there's nothing um, inevitable that you land on a path that you're stuck in, in middle income and you never be become high income. Like I said, it's bad policy, and bad implementation. So the, uh, think about that as more of a myth. Now, we started a bit late. Uh, I got John caught it. So we're ending a bit late. But um, finally, all good things must come to an end. So please join me in thanking our wonderful Ash Center events team led by Melissa back there, Danella, and her team, together with our two co-sponsors, the Harvard University Asia Center, and of course, HISA, Harvard Indonesian Students Association. Thank you very much. And most of all, last but not least, please join me in expressing our heartfelt appreciation to Pat Tom for so generously sharing his experience, experience and insights with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.